Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of The Moral Molecule, The Source of Love and Prosperity, by Paul J. Zak. Performed by Paul J. Zak. Introduction. Vampire Wedding. It was a lovely day for a wedding, the English sun peeking from behind English clouds as the guests gathered in their finest. The ceremony was going to be at Huncham Court, a Victorian manor house out in Devon, and it was set to begin in ten minutes. I was supposed to have shown up an hour ago. I parked my rented Vauxhall in the gravel courtyard, left the engine running, jumped out in my lab coat for an immediate reconnoiter, then commandeered a guest to help me carry in the 150-pound centrifuge and 30 kilos of dry ice I'd brought with me in the car. With a second trip, I carried in the syringes, 156 pre-labeled test tubes, tourniquets, alcohol preps, and band-aids that I'd shipped from California. The plan I'd worked out with Linda Geddes, the bride, was to take two samples, one blood draw immediately before the vows and one immediately after from a cross-section of friends and family in attendance. Within the wedding party itself, Linda's father was the only holdout. The mother of the groom had been ill, so he gave her a pass. Now, taking blood at weddings is not a long-standing tradition in this part of England, or anywhere else that I know of. In this case, the bride was a writer for the new scientist who had been following my research. She was also known for throwing herself into her stories gonzo-style. One day, out of the blue, she invited me to fly across the Atlantic to see her get married, but it wasn't because we'd become such close pals. She wanted me to run an experiment to illustrate a point. Just for fun, she wanted to see if the emotional uplift of her wedding would alter the guest's level of oxytocin, not to be confused with the often abused painkiller OxyContin, the chemical messenger I've been setting for the past several years. Oxytocin is known primarily as a female reproductive hormone, and usually it's associated less with wedding vows and champagne than with what, in an earlier time, often happened nine months after. Oxytocin controls contractions during labor, which is where many women encounter it as Pitocin, the commercially available synthetic version doctors inject in expectant mothers to induce delivery. Oxytocin is also responsible for the calm, focused attention mothers relish on their babies while breastfeeding. Then again, oxytocin is well represented, we hope, on wedding nights because it helps create the warm glow both women and men feel during sex, or a massage, or even a hug. Linda hadn't reached out to me because of anything new I had to say about oxytocin as the birth hormone or the cuddle hormone, but because of an entirely different role I discovered for it. My research had demonstrated that this chemical messenger, both in the brain and in the blood, is, in fact, the key to moral behavior, not just in our intimate relationships, but also in our business dealings, in politics, in society at large, which is a point I realize that might take some getting used to. Am I actually saying that a single molecule, and, by the way, a chemical substance that scientists like me can manipulate in a lab, accounts for why some people give freely of themselves and others are cold-hearted bastards? Why some people cheat and steal and others you can trust with your life? Why some husbands are more faithful than others? And, by the way, why women tend to be more generous and nicer than men? In a word, yes. Beginning in 2001, my colleagues and I conducted a number of experiments showing that when someone's level of oxytocin goes up, he or she responds more generously and caringly, even with complete strangers. As a benchmark for measuring behavior, we relied on the willingness of the people being tested to share real money in real time. To measure the increase in oxytocin, we took their blood and analyzed it. Money, as everybody knows, comes in conveniently measurable units, nickels and dimes, tens and twenties, which meant that we were able to quantify the increase in generosity by the amount someone was willing to share. We were then able to correlate these numbers with the increase in oxytocin found in the blood. Later, to be absolutely certain that what we were seeing was not just an association, but true cause and effect, we infused synthetic oxytocin into our study subjects' nasal passages, the next best thing to shooting it directly into their brains. 
As for cause and effect, we found that we could turn the behavioral response on and off like a garden hose. But what our work demonstrated first and foremost is that you don't need to shoot a chemical up someone's nose or have sex with them or even give them a hug in order to create the surge in oxytocin that leads to more generous behavior. Fortunately, all you have to do to trigger this moral molecule is give someone a sign of trust. When one person extends himself to another in a trusting way, the person being trusted experiences a surge in oxytocin that makes her less likely to hold back and less likely to cheat, which is another way of saying that the feeling of being trusted makes a person more trustworthy, which, over time, makes other people more inclined to trust, which, in turn, If you detect the makings of an endless loop here that can feed back onto itself, creating what might be called a virtuous cycle, and ultimately a virtuous society, you're getting the idea. And that's what's so incredibly exciting about this research. Obviously, there's more to it, because no one chemical in the body functions all alone, and other factors from a person's life experience play a role as well. But, as we'll see in the chapters ahead, Oxytocin orchestrates the kind of generous and caring behavior that every culture, everywhere in the world, endorses as the right way to live. The cooperative, benign, pro-social way of living that every culture, everywhere on the planet, describes as moral. Which is not to say that oxytocin always makes us good, or always generous and trusting. In a rough-and-tumble world, unwavering openness and loving-kindness will be like going around with a kick-me sign on your back. Instead, the moral molecule works like a gyroscope, helping us maintain our balance between behavior based on trust and behavior based on wariness and distrust. In this way, oxytocin helps us navigate between the social benefits of openness, which are considerable, and the reasonable caution we need to avoid being taken for a ride. It was oxytocin's ability to recognize and respond to the precise nature of human bonds and interactions that intrigued Linda, the bride, so much so that she invited me to her wedding. She wanted to see how witnessing all the promises to be faithful and caring and committed would play out not in her guests' behavior, but in their blood. Hunsham Court is about four hours west of London hidden among little villages with names like Lower Washfield, Studley, and Clayhanger. There's a crumbling Anglo-Saxon church on the grounds, but the official part of the ceremony was going to take place in the manor house itself, an old hunting lodge saturated with the smell of wood fires and oak paneling and the mounted heads of long-dead animals. After all my running back and forth, like the cliché mad scientist, I settled into the space just off the main room that had been set aside for my portable blood lab. The centrifuge, borrowed from the University of Exeter, the dry ice sent from London. To point the way for Helen, a nurse and friend of the bride's, who'd agreed to draw the blood, someone hung a makeshift sign on the door that said, Science Lab. I was delighted to have a locally and legally qualified assistant, but when Helen showed up, She was in high heels and a beige silk dress, not the surgical scrubs or lab coat I guess I'd imagined. No room for error here, I thought. We went over the protocol for the experiment, and I made sure all the equipment was turned on and ready. Then, with my well-dressed colleague in tow, I went to find my first victim. Luckily for me, Linda was running late herself. I found her in the bride suite upstairs, being fluffed and pampered by her mother and her bridesmaids, three young women dressed, appropriately enough, for a vampire wedding in bright crimson. Linda and I had never actually met, but on this happy occasion, she greeted me with hugs and kisses all the same. I said, you ready for this? She grinned nervously as her friend got down to business, placing the tourniquet on her arm and swabbing the skin. Not too keen on needles, actually, she said. Now you tell me, I replied, and reached for the smelling salts I had tucked away in my pocket, just in case. Through it all, 
neither bride nor guest nor yours truly fainted. Truth be told, I love the sight of blood. And Linda's dedication to a good story didn't spoil her big day. Near as I could tell, the assembled friends and family seemed to think all this blood-drawing business was actually quite a lark. After the vows and the registry signing inside the mansion, everyone went outside for the hand-fasting, a Celtic tradition involving personally crafted vows under a tree festooned, that's what they do in England, with colored ribbons, overseen in this case by a fellow journalist who happened to be Hindu. Covering all the bases, I suppose. Then the wedding party came back in for more blood draws. 24 samples in just under 10 minutes, and we were done. Linda and Nick, her good-natured groom, could move on to champagne and dinner and dancing on the lawn to the music of a swing band. But ever the science nerd, I was stuck back in the big house, spinning down the samples in the centrifuge, separating the serum and plasma from the red blood cells, and fast-freezing the blood products I needed to analyze for changes in oxytocin. Then, with my test tubes nestled in their cushion of dry ice, I slipped out quietly and began the long trek back to London, and from there the even longer trek back to my lab at Claremont Graduate University in Southern California. It took two weeks and about $500 for the samples to arrive via FedEx, and then another $2,000 for us to analyze the blood. But after all was said and done, the results showed just what we were hoping for, which was a simple snapshot of oxytocin's ability to read and reflect the nuances of a social situation, and thus become the monitor and key regulator of our moral behavior. Everybody knows that marriage ceremonies are emotionally charged. That's why people cry at weddings. That's why the bad boys and wedding crashers showed up at so many of them, to pick up girls primed and ready to be warm and cuddly. But the blood samples at Huncham Court showed us something much more interesting. The changes in individual oxytocin levels at Linda's ceremony could be mapped out like the solar system, with the bride as the sun. Between the first and second blood draws, which were only an hour apart, Linda's own level shot up by 28%. And for each of the other people tested, the increase in oxytocin was in direct proportion to the likely intensity of emotional engagement in the event. The mother of the bride? up 24%. The father of the groom, up 19%. The groom himself, up 13%. And on down the line, with siblings and friends with more peripheral roles to play. But why, you may ask, would the groom's increase be less than his father's? We'll get into this sort of thing more deeply along the way, but testosterone is one of several other hormones that can interfere with the release of oxytocin. Not too surprising when you think about it. I also found that the groom's testosterone had surged 100%. Our little study at the wedding had demonstrated, on the hoof, just the kind of graded and contingent sensitivity that allows oxytocin to guide us between trust and wariness, generosity and self-protection, not only in response to the official nature of relationships, my mother, my son-in-law, my dreaded classmate, a complete stranger, but in response to social cues in the moment. Should I feel safe and warm and cuddly in this crowd, or do I have to be on guard? Is this a situation in which oxytocin can call the tune, or is this an exchange in which survival will be better served by a surge of a stress hormone that will keep me on my guard? Or maybe it's a situation in which the very best outcome will result when oxytocin dominates in one party and is a healthy dose of testosterone driving the other. It's the sensitivity of oxytocin in its interaction with a range of other chemical messengers that helps to account for why human behavior is so infinitely complex and why the bliss of the wedding day and night is often hard to maintain. There's the old joke about the guy from Finland who couldn't understand why his wife was unhappy. I told you that I loved you when I asked you to marry me, he said. I don't see why I need to tell you again. But here's the much larger payoff from the much larger body of research my lab has conducted. 
After centuries of speculation about human nature, human behavior, and how we decide what is the right thing to do, here at last we have some news we can use, solid empirical evidence that illuminates the mechanism at the heart of the moral guidance system. As any engineer will tell you, understanding the basic mechanism is the first step towards improving a system's output, which, when the output is moral behavior, is no trivial matter. In just the past few years, new insights as to why people behave as they do have been flooding in from fields like behavioral economics, social neuroscience, neurotheology, evolutionary studies of altruism and cooperation, even happiness research. All these data suggest that, as a species, we are far less self-interested and, on balance, generally far kinder and more cooperative than the prevailing wisdom has ever acknowledged. But up until now, this scientifically enhanced insight into human nature, the good as well as the bad, still beg the question, given that humans can be both rational and irrational, ruthlessly depraved and immensely kind, shamefully self-interested as well as completely selfless, what specifically determines which aspect of our nature will be expressed when? When do we trust and when do we remain wary? When do we give of ourselves and when do we hold back? The answer lies in the release of oxytocin. Oxytocin surges when people are shown a sign of trust and or when something engages what was once called our sympathies, which is what we now call empathy. I'll delve into how empathy does its thing in Chapter 4. When oxytocin surges, people behave in ways that are kinder, more generous, more cooperative, and more caring. But when scientists call these behaviors pro-social, that's actually just a geek-speak way of saying that they follow the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This book is going to show you why this oxytocin effect happens, when it happens, and how we can make it happen more often. The fact that the moral molecule pries open the black box of human nature doesn't mean that there's nothing left for the philosophers and theologians to wrestle over. It's just that any discussion of free will or virtue seems a little pointless if it doesn't take into account everything science can contribute. And we've learned quite a lot since those early prophets tried to define what God wanted us to do and the philosophers tried to figure it out through the power of reason. After all the theological debates and all the philosophical discourse and all the new evidence, one thing we know for sure is that humans are intensely social creatures. The human brain reacts more intensely to a human face than to any other object in the universe. That's because survival during our first years of life is entirely dependent on the goodwill of others, namely our parents, and their willingness to invest resources in us. Even after we're old enough to provide for ourselves, we continue to depend on a web of social cooperation to stay alive and healthy. We are, in fact, what zoologists call an obligatorily gregarious species, meaning that we thrive in groups and that we don't do well, either physically or emotionally, for long periods alone. All of which helps to explain why we are so intensely interested not only in other people's facial expressions and emotions, but also in their behavior. Who's doing what to whom? Who's a stand-up guy? And who's a sleazeball hiding behind the fake smile? Oxytocin primes us to react appropriately, even when we have no idea that it's on the job. In this book, I'm going to explore oxytocin's influence on the individual, its influence on close personal relationships, and then its influence on society as a whole. Along the way, we're going to see how various life experiences and different ways of thinking can alter the oxytocin effect. We'll also look into the influence of religion, a biggie when it comes to discussions of morality, as well as the influence of a market economy. In turn, we'll also discuss oxytocin's influence on those well-established institutions. 
a consistent theme is going to be that unless the release of oxytocin is impaired, the golden rule is a lesson the body already knows. And when we get it right, we feel the rewards immediately. These range from better health to a happier life to, believe it or not, a more prosperous economy. And the vast majority of people don't have to be beaten over the head, don't have to listen to long sermons, and don't have to be threatened with health fire and damnation to want to treat others well. To elicit that naturally occurring benign behavior, all we have to do is to create the circumstances in which oxytocin can exercise its influence, which means, in large part, keeping other hormonal influences out of the way. Easier said than done, of course, but I think you'll agree that knowing how the system actually works is an excellent start. We began the oxytocin story at a wedding, which is all the more appropriate because oxytocin, as you may recall, is a reproductive hormone. A biological link between sex and morality? What a concept. Hundreds of millions of years ago, when sex first evolved, depending on the kindness of strangers was a good way to become lunch. Big fish eat little fish was the order of the day, every day. So how were two creatures supposed to get together to mate? They needed a chemical messenger that would make it safe to trust. By prompting benign behavior in response to trust. Sound familiar? The role of trust has woven through everything we'll be discussing here. It even permeates the backstory of how I came to be doing this work. As I'll explain in greater detail later, I actually began my academic career building economic models of what makes countries prosper. My early work demonstrated that the most important factor in determining whether or not a society does well or remains impoverished is not natural resources, education, quality health care, or even the work ethic of its people. What matters most in determining economic outcomes is actually trustworthiness, a moral consideration. That's the insight that led me to the moral molecule.